remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And before we get into this week's topic, I want to go through a little bit of a house cleaning uh, item, I suppose you would say, here on the show. Um, we've been on uh, YouTube now for about three years, and we've got a, a good following, and a lot of people that follow us every week and follow us on Facebook and Twitter and those sorts of things, and we thank you for it. It's been very successful. But one of the pieces of feedback that I often get about this show is that even though we're on YouTube, it's not always real convenient to, to get through a whole episode because, let's face it, YouTube is, is most suited for, uh, you know, watching a, a video of a, of a keyboard cat for 90 seconds or, you know, someone falling on their face for a minute, you know, something like that. It's kind of short, quick hits is what YouTube really does well. Not a lot of people go to YouTube to, to sit and watch something for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or an hour or something like that. YouTube is capable of that, of course, and we have this show on YouTube, but that's not how most people use it. Uh, really, most people would, would rather have something like that in a podcast format where they can take it with them and put it on their iPhone or whatever listening device they've got and take it to the gym with them or on the train to work or that kind of thing. So we have been cognizant of that. And with that in mind, we have uh, considered the idea and are moving forward with the idea of adding a weekly podcast to the America's Evil Genius Online Entertainment Empire. Uh, this show is not going away. It'll still be on YouTube roughly every week, but we will also be adding in a, an audio podcast that you can download and take with you uh, in some way. So we're still a couple of weeks from that happening. We're getting all the technical kinks worked out now and in terms of where it'll be hosted and all of that. So we're dealing with that on the back end. But here in about hopefully two weeks or, or so is what we're shooting for that you'll be able to get that Travis Cook podcast every week in addition to the show. Uh, what we would like to do is have the audio podcast come out on Sunday nights uh, so you can download it and have it ready for that week and then do this video presentation on YouTube roughly in the middle of the week, about a Wednesday or so. So you can see that uh, here in a couple weeks. If, by the way, you would like a sneak preview as to what the podcast would sound like, you can go to SoundCloud and uh, look up my ID on there, Travis Cook 18 Travis Cook 18 and uh, you will see kind of a test podcast we put up there a couple weeks ago. So you can get an idea of what it's going to be like. I'm not saying it's going to end up being exactly like that. There's going to be some tweaks in terms of the formatting and, and all the little bells and whistles we put in. But uh, that will at least give you a sneak peek and a, a taste of what we're going to do. So that's what's coming down the road. But to this week's topic on the uh, mothership, if you will, the video broadcast, the video blog of America's Evil Genius... It is primary time in certain parts of America. You're seeing congressional and Senate primaries happen. And as, as often happens at this time, the uh, divide within the Republican Party, the fight within the Republican Party, comes up between the conservatives, or the Tea Partiers, if you will, and the more moderate or establishment Republicans. Tea Partiers versus establishment, conservatives versus moderates. That little divide, that little fight in the Republican Party comes into play mainly now during primary time. And so you're hearing a lot of moderate Republicans, a lot of establishment Republicans, a lot of, quote, leadership Republicans, and even more than a few Democrats, who I've always wondered why they're so interested in who has control of our party. That's never made sense to me. Anyway, you're hearing a lot of these people have the discussion of, you conservatives need to temper your positions a little bit. You need to go along to get along. You need to vote for moderate candidates because they're the only ones who have the hope of winning in the general elections. You need to put some of that conservatism aside and you need to be more pragmatic and you need to get behind these moderate candidates because it's your only chance of winning. You can only win with the moderates, they would tell us, whether we're talking about a congressional race or whether we're talking about a presidential race down, down the road, maybe someone like a, a Chris Christie running, something like that. Well, setting aside the data that's out there that, uh, and the research, it shows that this might not actually be the case. Let's pretend, for sake of our discussion today, that the moderates is the only way for a Republican win. Is, 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 let's pretend like that's 
a legitimate strategy. Let's pretend like that's true for purposes of our discussion today. If we assume that it's true that only a moderate Republican can win a general election, then I think it raises a rather obvious question for us conservatives. What do we actually win if we vote for a moderate Republican and they win the big election? Now, I'm, I'm not asking that question flippantly. That's not a knee-jerk reaction. I actually want to go down the road of what does that actually mean. In other words, if the only way a Republican can win is to nominate a moderate candidate and then they win, well then what have we as conservatives actually won? Hmm. It's where I sit. I don't see where we win very much in that hypothetical case. Now don't get me wrong. I have... Uh, you see a lot of younger folks getting into this conservative movement. It's great they're here. They're the lifeblood of this thing. They're going to be the ones to, to carry us forward. Even a lot of our more libertarian-leaning conservatives, I welcome them into the fold. Uh, but I'm a little bit older than that. Um, just turned 40 last week, which I don't like to admit in public. But I guess I'm now officially an old fart. And so I've been voting in presidential elections now since 1992. So that's about 22 years that I've been involved at least you know, in terms of voting in politics. And so I've heard this argument many, many, many times. I've heard the argument of, well, if you don't vote for whatever the moderate Republican of the day is, if you don't vote for him, then that Bill Clinton's going to get in office and he's going to be horrible. Or that Al Gore's going to get in office, he's going to be horrible. That John Kerry's going to get in office. That Barack Obama's going to get in office. They're going to be horrible. And now they're saying that let's say a Chris Christie or a Jeb Bush gets a Republican nomination, if we, the conservatives, don't back them, if we don't make sure they get into the Oval Office, then, well, Hillary Clinton is sure to win. And that would be horrible. Well, it is true that a Hillary Clinton would be horrible in office. It is true that a Barack Obama has been horrible in office. You can see that every day. It would have been true that a John Kerry would have been a disaster, that an Al Gore would have been a disaster, that a Bill Clinton was a disaster, although not nearly as much of one as Bill Clinton, as a Barack Obama is. But it's true that when the Democrat wins, it is an unmitigated disaster. But have the moderate Republicans that have gotten in been much better? Hmm. I mean, go all the way back to 1968. And the Republicans were reeling from the 64 election where Barry Goldwater lost, a truly conservative candidate. Kind of the Tea Party of his day, if you will. And everybody in the party said that, well, you, you, you can't ever nominate a conservative again. You'd just get killed. And the whole party turned their back on the conservative wing. Uh, except for Richard Nixon, who did at least make some, uh, make some inroads with the conservatives and with the southern uh, former Democrats who are, who are now joining the Republican fold. He was the only major Republican candidate to do that. He ended up winning the election. Now, he certainly did not govern as a conservative, so things really didn't get much better. The conservatives backed him. They helped him get into office, but then once he got in there, he put out the EPA. God, how many of us would like to kill off the EPA today? That was Nixon's baby. Richard Nixon put in wage and price controls to hurt the economy. How many of us conservatives would have gotten behind that? Yeah, he was a social conservative, but that's kind of where it ended. So things didn't go well there. 1988, we were told that we needed to get behind George H.W. Bush. And in Bush's defense, similar to Nixon, he promised that he would govern along conservative lines. However, once he got elected, he did not do that. And he did raise taxes, even though promising not to. And even after winning a war in Iraq, we had to get rid of him. Things didn't go much better there. He expanded government too. And then the piece de resistance was his son, George W. Bush, in 2000 and 2004. A man who I truly believe is a decent human being and was a good social conservative. But we were sold on this compassionate conservative garbage that we'll never get away from big government. We just got to have Republicans in there and quote unquote conservatives in there who can run big government better than the liberals can, the lesser of the two evils. Well, what did we get? We got George W. Bush who, for all the good things he did in foreign policy, and yes, I'm telling you the Iraq war was perfectly legitimate, but setting that aside, 
George W. Bush did expand government, did spend like a drunken sailor. There's no doubt about it. He certainly was not a fiscal conservative. In fact, he might have been a social conservative, but I would almost call him a liberal in terms of expanding government and believing that government could be a significant boon to the American people, that it could be a problem-solving body when it rarely is. So we've put moderates in there before. We've done it. We've gotten moderates into office. We've sucked it up and backed them. We've got them into office, and things have never really gotten better. We've never, we've always been promised that we put the moderate in there. It's the first step towards moving America in a more conservative direction, but it never seems to happen. Richard Nixon was in office for, what, six years? Did he appreciably move America as a nation further to the right? No, he did not. George H.W. Bush was in office for four years. Did he appreciably move America further to the right? No, he did not. George W. Bush was in office for eight years. Did he appreciably move America as a nation and a culture further to the right? No, he did not. So recent history shows that conservatives don't actually win when we back the moderate candidate just to get the Republicans in office, just to vote for the lesser of the two evils. And not even counting in the fact that a lot of these moderates they put up there did not win. Your Bob Doles, your John McCain's, your Mitt Romney's, your Gerald Ford's. So I'm looking at this reasoning. I'm looking at Republicans and moderates and even Democrats who have no say in the matter, but that's never, never kept them from opening their traps anyway. I'm hearing these people say that we need to back the moderate candidate. And again, I go back to the, to the question, why? What do we get out of it? From the way I look at it, the Republican Party for the last 50 years, roughly, has been the luckiest party in the history of American politics because they really have had no competition. The only competition they've had has been the Democratic Party, who has for the last half century been so off the rails, pardon my French, batshit crazy. They've been the party of killing babies and backing criminals and backing the lazy. They've been so far off the rails from American principles that a reasonable, sane, and morally centered human being could never vote for one. So the only question was, would a reasonably sane, morally centered American vote for the Republican or not? Sometimes we do, sometimes we just stay home. But the bottom line is the Republican Party has not really had to work for the votes of conservatives, for the votes of reasonably sane, morally centered American people. They've never really had to work for those votes. They've just had to paint a scary enough picture of the Democrat, which was not hard to do, to get us to the polls. And make no mistake, I'm, when I'm blaming people of my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation, for accepting that, for falling for that, I'm pointing the finger of blame at myself as much as I am anybody. During my 20s, back in the 1990s, I fell into that trap. I voted for Bob Dole. I'm not proud of it. I sucked it up and voted for John McCain. I wasn't proud of it, but I was hopeful that maybe Sarah Palin would find her way into the Oval Office. I even voted for Mitt freaking Romney last time against every fiber of my being, but I knew what a disaster Obama was. So I'm saying this to tell you that I as a conservative, I as a Republican, but I'm a conservative first and foremost, I accept responsibility for my mistakes in the past. I have been part of the problem, and a lot of the rest of us have been too. But that does not mean that we have to continue those incorrect behaviors, those incorrect actions. We do not have to continue beating our head into the wall and backing the moderate Republican who will do very little good simply because the Democrat is, is, is worse, simply because it's the less of the two evils. If voting for the Republican candidate is only the lesser of the two evils, but it turns out that it isn't that much of a lesser, that much of a lesser of the two evils, then what's the point? What are we as conservatives actually winning? Well, from what I see in, re in, re in recent history, not a lot. 
We're told that tomorrow America will go in a more conservative direction, and yet tomorrow never seems to come. And what I'm starting to learn as I enter my middle age, after 20 plus years of being involved in the political process and voting and citizenship and so forth, what I'm starting to learn is that tomorrow never will come as long as we allow ourselves to be manipulated by the Republican Party to vote for the moderate or the more electable candidate, who oftentimes doesn't end up being more electable, simply so that a Republican can get into office. And simply in the name of defeating the marginally worse Democrat. So I go back to the question that faces us for 2016. Because we're already hearing it now. If Christie's the nominee, you got to back him because Hillary would be worse. Well, yes, Hillary would be worse. No doubt about that. But how much worse would she be? I mean, Chris Christie's already shown by his actions as governor of New Jersey that he believes in the concept of the federal government. Look no further than his actions after Hurricane Sandy to demonstrate that. So Hillary may not be much worse. Not that I'm ever going to vote for her, not that I'm ever going to advocate that anybody do that. But I might be open to a third party candidate this time around if someone like Chris Christie's the nominee. And yes, people are going to come in and say, well, that, that ensures Hillary will win. Well, maybe it does. And yes, it would suck. Yes, it would be horrible. But I'm thinking of something along the lines of what happens to drug addicts sometimes. You know, they say that a drug addict or an addict of any nature, I'm not seeing a lot of drug addicts, but that an addict cannot reform until they truly hit rock bottom. Now, any of you who have dealt with substance abuse or have had family members that dealt with it or friends or any other kind of addiction, you know oftentimes that what you think would be rock bottom for them turns out not to be. When, when you think they've hit rock bottom, they really have it. That there's a rock bottom out there so much far beyond what you could consider that they got to hit that. It's got to get horribly bad for them before they see the light. Maybe that's where America is. And while I do not want to see a Hillary Clinton or any of those other yahoos on the Democratic side in office, maybe it's the kind of cold shot this country needs to wake the hell up. Maybe America's got to hit rock bottom. I don't want that to happen. But I'm not going to stay on this treadmill of electing moderates who, in reality, do not want to reduce the federal government, do not want to eliminate large portions of the federal government, and frankly, do not believe in conservatism. I'm willing to endure some degree of a short-term hell in order to save America in the long term. And make no mistake, only conservatism, fiscal, social, and cultural conservatism, all three, only conservatism can possibly save America. No other philosophy brings anything to the table. And we've seen moderates, centrists, and liberals dominate the scene for a century. And you see what a mistake most of the 20th century has been from a governmental policy perspective. So they no longer should have a seat at the table. It should be only conservatism that we consider. The Republican Party ends up not being the party that will push that, then maybe they need to go by the wayside. Let's face a very cold and sober fact for a moment. Whenever we hear that question of Republicans can only win with moderates, it's the only way you can win. They're saying the word you with reference to Republicans as though that's how we define ourselves. You might be surprised to find, some of you who are our critics, that very few of us actually define ourselves as Republicans first and foremost. As I alluded to earlier, the Republican Party has been so significantly lucky in that people like us have had no other party to caucus with that by default, when we have voted, we have voted with Republicans. But we do not believe in a lot of what some Republicans stand for. We define ourselves as conservatives first and Republicans a distant second, if at all. So what I'm, what I'm asking you, what I'm telling you, 
is that when you ask the question of how can you best win an election, I'm not answering that from the perspective of how a Republican can win an election. I don't, and again, pardon my French, I don't give two shits about the Republican Party. What I care about is the conservative movement. And whatever form that has to take to win the day and dominate American politics and move our culture further to the right is what I will get behind. Now, if it can be done within the Republican Party, that's great. You've got an infrastructure there. You've got an apparatus already set to move forward. That would be the quickest way to do it, and we should do it that way if possible. But if it's not possible, then screw the Republican Party. They can rot in hell alongside the Democrats. So, in closing, let me say this. If this party vote, if this party uh, nominates another moderate, another milquetoast moderate for president in 2016, then they will not get my vote. And they will not be able to scare me with a Hillary presidency so much that I close my mouth, put my head down, and vote for that moderate Republican. I will start looking for a third party candidate. And GOP, you better realize this. Without the conservatives out there, not only voting for you, but pounding the pavement at election time, canvassing door to door, working the phone banks, donating money, driving people to the polls, all that dirty little grunt work, that unglamorous grunt work that wins close elections that no one likes to do, but it's critical. Without us doing that, you don't have anybody to replace us. You will never win a big election again. Now, I hope it doesn't have to come to that kind of ultimatum. But if it does, make no mistake, I and millions of others this time will side securely on the side of conservatism. We have learned from our mistakes during the 90s and the 2000s. The Republican Party may have to die so that it can live again or that something can rise in its place that's far more appropriate in terms of conservatism and saving America. So I'm telling you right out, I am not loyal to this party, and the other conservatives are not going to be loyal to this party either. If you want our loyalty, you've got to earn it. Otherwise, we have no problem with your precious Republican Party dying. Got it? There's your ultimatum. Game on. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We will see you next time.